Hey everyone, this is Renee from iMore.com. Welcome to our weekly show focused on everything iPhone and iPad. From news and views to help and how-tos, this is iPhone and iPad Live. Hit the music. I like music. It's Wednesday, January 25th, 2012, and joining me tonight is the co-host of Iterate and the chief... I'm going to say intelligence officer of Nickelfish, Seth Clifford. Hey, Renee, you're close. It's, it's information. I have, I have the informations. Oh, so this is not a spy thing? You're not a both in? No, 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 no. All right. Well, I'm going to assume that you're, you are, and you're just lying to you know, keep your cover identity from the Empire secure. Well, I can't, I can't release that kind of information. I mean, many both ins have already died. <laughs> <laughs> There's some things I wish I didn't know already, Seth, so that's, that's absolutely no problem. <laughs> Also joining us is the host of Apps and Accessories Live and Zen and Tech, Georgia. How are you, Georgia? I'm doing well. I'm happy to be here. Me too. I heard, I think I heard wheels screeching, doors slamming, and steps being jumped down mere moments ago, so I'm glad you made it. I'm glad I made it too. I'm still in therapy clothing, so. Oh, you're in your big girl clothes. I am. I am. All right, so uh, Seth and I are going to look like little kids by comparison, but hey, we can handle it. (laughs) <laughs> so I wanted to start off uh, because we've been in such a rush lately. We we rebranded the site and we went promptly to CES and we did not explain ourselves to our audio video listeners. We put up a blog post about it, but we didn't give you guys um, the what's up, the explanation, um, the reasoning behind it. So Tippy.com is now iMore. And th- the basic thing with it was we kind of outgrew Tippy. Tippy was in response to Apple's iPad and us covering both iPhone and iPad, but it just kept growing. Um, Apple kept putting iOS and more things like the Apple TV. They kept expanding the ecosystem. There was more apps, more accessories, more of everything. Uh, and just like Steve Jobs originally, and now Phil Schiller said that Apple stands at the crossroads of technology and liberal arts, we kind of felt like we were trying to thumb a ride on that highway as well. So we changed our name and we are now officially, Georgia, what is it again? I'm more. That's it. More of everything you love about your iPhone, iPad, and iOS. Seth, what say you? I think it's fantastic. I I have to say, with change, people are have a really hard time with change. So we got a little bit of slack. Some people were really attached to Tippy. Yeah, so, they weren't attached to it when we first changed the name, and they hated it. They hated it. They couldn't stand Tippy. They thought it was the most horrible of horrible things. But um, I think that people are going to be comfortable with iMore, just like they got we got comfortable with the iPad. And you know, my mom said, why did you change the name? This is my mom. I'm like, well, spell Tippy. She's like, T-I-P-P. Oh, wait a minute. T-B. The I and I'm like that's why we changed the name. And since then, she's never forgotten it. She can actually go to the site by typing in the name in a browser now, and that's an epic win. So can Kevin Mitchell's father. And it's so much easier for me to tell people this is where I am, so they can spell it. Yeah, um, and that's I the big thing for it. us. And I actually, uh, with Ashley Esqueda, the host of our Monday Brief, did a, a brief little tribute, a song uh, that's I More. Check it out. You can go to YouTube slash. Um, I more videos, and you can enter a contest there to win two hundred dollars in iTunes monies. So do that, please. I didn't sing for no reason. <laughs> well, don't make him sing again, please. Oh, please, yeah, please, please, please <laughs> don't, don't make. <laughs> for the love of all that's holy, do not make him sing again. Uh, I can do many things in this world, and singing is not one of them. We also wait. Uh, wasn't, weren't you and Seth going to do uh, some sort of song? Song nope. and dance for us? Nope. I am jailbreaking, I and you that. are pure. You've got <laughs> green poison. Yes, that's for sure. Right, Seth, now, now you're supposed to start the beatbox thing. <laughs> I don't oh, know beatbox man. and Sinatra. Oh. So how about those financials, huh? <laughs> oh, before we get to the financials, we've also um, we kind of we we merged like Transformers style, like. Like, like Devastator, we merged iPhone and iPad Live into this very show. And that gave us an open spot on Sundays. So Georgia promptly took it. She rushed in, she planted her flag. And what's your new show called, Georgia? It's Apps and Accessories Live. So we're going to go through all kinds of the coolest, newest, and greatest apps and all the hundreds of accessories that are coming in. This, in boxes this, around her right so now. I do. I have boxes all over the place. Um, 
Yeah, I would Tons show you stuff. what I'm going to be talking about later. But, we did a uh, pilot for the show on Sunday. We had some issues with the recording. Um, we had some problems with the ISP and stuff, so we haven't put it up yet. I may not be able to save it, but if not, we'll start up a uh, brand new, pure and professional right after Macworld. Right, exactly. Um, that's exactly it. And speaking of which, uh, Leanna and I are going to be at Macworld starting tomorrow afternoon. That's Thursday afternoon for people listening to this at a later date. And we are going to be bringing you, I think she's got lined up developer interviews. We're going to be walking the trade show floor. We're going to cover the bejesus out of that trade show. Macworld's, Ma Macworld Pipe iWorld, sorry. Seth has got a new name. Mm, the pipe is important. It is. You have to put something in your internet pipe and smoke it. Mm -hmm. Hit that pipe. And the last little bit of meta, actually, no, there's two bits of meta left that I want to cover. First, Inside Apple, the new book that purports to give away all the secrets, all of Apple's magics, uh, is now available. We're giving away some copies. So if you go to imore.com slash contests, you'll see that's up there along with a bunch of other ones. Um, yeah, actually, there's a ton of contests this week. I'm losing track of how many contests there are. Go there, enter, win stuff. We love you to have it. We and are going, um, yeah, contest, giveaway, crazy. And I think perhaps the biggest news of this millennium or any other is that, Georgia, w w what, what are you holding that we can't see? Siri, can I have an iPhone 4S? So, um... Everything you need to know about Apple products is at Apple's website. No, it's at iMore. Oh, what a Siri fail. Oh, I'm very, very sad. But um, I got one. Seth, finally, uh, I had to give in. It's October and January, Seth. Exactly. It's, it's all special yes. all over again. So what do you think? Give us your pellet review. How is it so far? I'm really enjoying I'm very happy. I love the fact of the little pop-ups that come on screen whenever I get a text message. Oh, hold on. on. You don't only have iPhone 4S. You also have iOS 5 for the first time. Yeah. I do. I do. So I love the pop-ups. I love Siri. I have to say, I'm, uh, a, yeah, I, this is the first time with iPhone. I have not jailbroken it as of yet. And am I missing my jailbreak? A little bit. A yeah, little we bit. have a content. We have like a, a thing to see how long Georgia can go before she jailbreaks. Before I jailbreak. Um, I'm enjoying it. I, Siri sometimes does not understand what I say. It's my Canadianism, so that's the only problem. Oh, Justin Horn is saying is laughing at you for only getting to iOS 5 now, and Lloyd the Droid is blaming you for Apple's insane profits. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lloyd, but it is true. And Brad is proud of me. Thank you, yeah. Brad. Um, it's true. So I'm enjoying it. I think that it's a really great phone. Um, it's faster uh, taking pictures now because I take pictures of everything. I had a thousand four hundred. Yeah, how's the camera? Six pictures on my phone and I'm enjoying it to be able to just take a picture. Wonderful. Glowing light mod coming up. Well, how's, how are you liking the new camera? I love it. I love the new camera. It's beautiful. Here, I'm going to take a picture of the chat room. Everyone smile. Do you have a uh, photo stream all set up? Because I know you take a ton of pictures. I do. I, I have the only thing that I have to uh, say is that I, you know, having having my pictures out so that everyone's going to be able to, I don't know, uh, privacy issues are still a little bit for me. Georgia does not trust the interweb. She believes that there's a bunch of little elves in there that look at everything she's doing. And according to O2, which we'll talk about later, that might not be a bad, you know, assumption. Right. So, on with the very big show. Georgia, what have you got for us this evening? So we have Apple's Q1 2012 financial results. Did they make some money? They, they might have made just a touch of money. Uh, $46.33 billion in revenue. With a B? Billion. My God. Billion dollars. Go ahead. Do your little tiny. Seth, do the little. Uh, Tim I, Cook is rolling naked in money this morning. What did you want me to raise my pinky as you said it? Raise is my that pinky. And that means 37 million iPhones, 15 million iPads, and... 15 million iPods. Yeah, Leanna did her traditional, uh, her traditional, I, uh, what's it called? Um, Apple Q1 2012 by the numbers uh, post. And she's, she's got the tallies here. So it's $97.6 billion in cash on hand, almost $100 billion in the Apple money bin. Ah, me money bin. That's insane. That's more money than most other companies and countries combined. 
<laughs> Apple it could buy ridiculous. a subcontinent. It's a lot of they have a lot of revenue, and and they were they were called the number one company as well. So. Well, they yeah, the number I believe they've passed Exxon again for market cap. The scary thing yeah. is, this was the second best quarter of earnings for any company ever. And all the other top 10 companies are all part of the oil oligopoly that gets to um, leverage scarce natural resources and fossil fuels. Apple's the only one who doesn't dig into your backyard and charge you a fortune for oil to make this kind of money. And that means it's 73% in growth. Um, it's 133% in growth for um, accessories. For iPhone and accessories revenue alone. And- $24 billion in iPhone revenue, Jeez. including yours, Georgia. Actually, no, yours counts for this quarter, not last quarter. It does. It does, though Though Lloyd blames me for why they're doing so well. But and the numbers are crazy. Like you said, 37 million iPhones sold, 50 million iPads, 50 million iPods, half of which are iPods Touch. So that's 70. That, I do iPods Touch like Surgeons General, Seth, just FYI. Um, no, I heard that, yeah. 7.7 million iPod touch, iPods Touch. Three, that's 62 million iOS devices this quarter, 315 cumulative iOS devices ever. It was enough. Are you ready, Georgia? Are you ready? Yes, please. For, please. I, for iOS to outsell even the mighty Android last quarter. And that means all Android phones. It's not yes. one, it's everything. It's all iOS devices versus all Android devices. Um, that's... That's insane. I guess there was a lot of pent up demand. I mean, there wasn't any really big. There was the Droid Razor and the the Nexus, uh, Galaxy Nexus, but there weren't a lot of really. You, it's hard to have a big Android Hero device because there's so many of them. But a lot of people were waiting for the iPhone 4s. They'd expected it months earlier. There was tons of pent up demand, but still, that's insane. Well, Justin from the chat room says, I know Apple's trick. Make really good products and don't treat your customers like criminals. <laughs> Though Lloyd points out it's only by 0.1%. No, that's hey, really valid. Win. Yeah, but it's going to flip-flop again. I mean, <laughs> Apple is not going to release another new phone for a year. In the meantime, there'll be all the Android 4.0 devices rolling out. Uh, probably not this quarter. Uh, Phil Nickinson from Android Central says it usually takes them an extra quarter to get them out. So maybe by March... Uh, and Apple will have been on the market for you know six months by then, so it'll look old, and the the numbers will swing back again. But I, I I remember Georgia, we were arguing about whether iPhone would ever hit ten million in sales in one quarter. I remember. I remember we used to run the numbers. It's uh, nine million. So close. It's so amazing. It's it's uh, one phone. It's just one phone to be able to sell that many phones. Like you really have to make Apple has to really make sure that people like this phone and still like it because it didn't change. You know, although Siri pulled me over. The Verizon number, Seth. I don't know if you caught those, but of the seven odd, seven odd million smartphones they sold, four and a half odd of those were iPhones. So roughly fifty five percent of the uh, smartphones Verizon sold last quarter were iPhones, and Verizon's mm-hmm. the people who brought us the Droid uh, to begin with. Yeah, I did notice that. I I think it's probably less it's probably less important that they sold that many iPhones. I think it probably just speaks more to the fact that Verizon seems to be the the winner in in the carriers in that they pretty much cover the range I think with the better devices. I think I feel like Verizon has better Android devices than AT&T does by and large and now that they have the 4S2, I think people are very happy there and they have pretty much whatever they want. But wait, but wait, it, uh, the iPhone 4S doesn't have a 4-inch screen. It doesn't have LTE. People, no one's going to buy it. Yeah, some some people did. Yeah, a couple. Yeah. Some I know some people didn't. And they actually, well, not for a while. They were late. Tardy. Uh, Tim Cook was actually asked about that in the uh, press conference. And he was, you know, he's not going to tell you what future plans look like. So he wouldn't comment on bigger screens or LTE. But he did say that given the number of sales, he thinks there's a pretty good market for the 3G four inch device that Apple's already selling. And uh, people are buying them. People are issuing bigger screened, faster networked phones for iPhones, which is, which is kind of interesting. Well, why do you think? Is it, um, because they're so easy to use, because they're reliable, because Apple takes care of their customers. I'm not going to tell you because I wrote an editorial on it that's on the list for a couple a couple bullet points from now. Okay, fair enough. Hold off. Hold, like please. That way. 
be that way. Oh, please. Well, because a couple other things he said that was interesting. They asked him about Kindle Fire. You know, Seth has a Kindle Fire. Well, he um, spoke a lot about if it would be, if the Kindle Fire would be able to affect the iPad sales. And what happened? Seth, what do you think by the numbers that we got? I, I don't think it would even really come close. Tim Cook said that uh, he checks the numbers weekly, and based on what he can tell, there was no... Because the question actually was asked, did the Kindle help iPad sales? I, I guess it was a very pro-Apple analyst who asked this, and he said, do people go to the stores and find the Kindle has limited functionality um, and n not the apps that they want, and buy an iPad instead? And Cook said that's not true either. It didn't hurt the sales. It didn't help the sales. It had basically no effect on, on iPad sales. He thinks it's a very different market, that people who want an iPad want an iPad. They don't want a lower-cost device, and people who want a lower-cost device don't want an iPad. I think he's... Very... Go ahead, Seth. I was just going to say, I think he's he's right about that to some degree, in that people... Like, I bought that thing not trying to replace an iPad with it. I bought it because I was curious, and I wanted to play with it. And I think people that are very heavily invested in you know, the Amazon ecosystem like their Kindles, and I think it's a good device for them, you know, the, my gripes notwithstanding. Uh, but there are probably are some people that are like, wow, 500 bucks is just too much to spend for an iPad. I'll spend this 200 and this will be good enough. And But that's, I think that's a smaller percentage than than the split between people who would only buy an iPad and would buy a Kindle Fire either instead of or in addition to an iPad, you know? The interesting thing, George, is or he is said it that... perhaps too early in the market for the Kindle to notice its dent? Well, that's, that's true, too. I mean, it's very much like a 1.0 device, so... I'd be curious to know if Amazon continues the push and releases a stronger device, you know, within the year to just kind of keep making that platform stronger. But, it, you know, there's I, I think that there's enough excitement around the device, but I just don't think it's quite as much excitement as the the iPad. And And furthermore, Amazon's App Store, in my experience, is OK, but it doesn't even have nearly as many apps as. Uh, the regular Google market does and the um, the the range of like Kindle Fire apps is really kind of embarrassing to be quite it honest really it's is just an e-reader yeah uh, it, it's like it's if you want not, it for anything else you're not going to be pleased no because you can listen to music you can you can read magazines you can watch movies like it's it's basically for all those other media types and you can also run some apps like apps are really an afterthought uh, the thing that was actually kind of beyond the Kindle even is that uh, they asked him, of course, is the iPad cannibalizing Mac sales? And he gave the standard answer. Yes, we believe it is cannibalizing Mac sales. We believe it's cannibalizing PC sales much, much more. And he loves that, of course. Um, he, but he also said that what's what's interesting is that the tablets market, aka mostly an iPad market, is actually outselling desktop PCs now. Not all PCs, but just desktop uh, PCs. He thinks the iPad is a huge opportunity for Apple, and he doesn't think limited functionality, lower cost tables or e or tablets or e-readers are in the same category. He doesn't think people who want iPads will settle for less. He he says last year was not the year of the tablet; it was the year of the iPad too, which we basically said in our big uh, you know New Year's Day post this year. He thinks it's just going to be the device going forward. Renee, did you see anything at CES that you thought could rival the iPad? No, and I mean this was exactly that editorial I put up is that I think and I think I've mentioned on the show before, I think they're aiming wrong. I think Amazon is aiming better, but you know, my mom loves her iPad. She presses home, presses an app, presses home, presses an app. A Mac is far too complicated for her. PC way too complicated, and most of the other tablets are advertising themselves as more powerful, more complicated and have more desktop-like metaphors, and I think that's not what the mainstream wants. They want something simpler and easier and Apple's the only one catering to that market. And they have a killer ecosystem to back it up. And everything at CES now was like quad core and, you know, and ice cream sandwich is fantastic, but I would like using it, but I prefer using a laptop. For a tablet, the iPad is different. You know, it's a different experience and not trying to be a replacement. Simple, fast, efficient. It's and not it about being fa faster or lighter or thinner. These are. <laughs> no, but I think Apple's absolutely <laughs> true. It's about the experience. Um, and speaking of which, the other, I'm just going to blast through these because we have a lot to talk about, 85 million 
iCloud customers. And this was perhaps the, the most salient line in Tim Cook's speech, that iCloud is the strategy for the next decade for Apple. It, iCloud, obviously, and I'll back up, and this is not an uncommon thought, Apple originally pitched iTunes and the Mac as the internet, sorry, not the internet, the, the media hub for the family. It was where all your stuff, iPhoto, iTunes, where everyone would come together. Um, but that's kind of primitive now. Everything is going to the cloud, and iCloud is Apple's answer. And it's him saying that, I think, really shows how important that service is going to be for Apple and just everything they do, whether it's the mythical Apple television or you know things like the education services they're putting out. I think everything increasingly is going to use iCloud as its backbone. I, you know, now I have access to iCloud, and I I know I'm in the minority, and it's not as infiltrating as say Facebook that now wants to track every single uh, article that you read, every website that you go to, every song that you play. It's not that infiltrating yet. I still just don't feel uh, comfortable with the idea of all of my photos, all of my applications going into a cloud. I know, I just... But you know how they're going to get you? It's like, and you've complained before that yes, you bought music. Well, you've bought music and then you've yeah. lost it and you've had to buy it again. And you never, with iCloud, you never have to do that. That music, just like apps, is waiting for you. And they'll get you with the easy stuff, with the stuff where your yes. convenience overcomes your privacy concerns. Yes, it's exactly that. Plus, um, you know, whereas Facebook... I feel is exceptionally infiltrating and wants to sell my information. Uh, Apple has a greater deal of feeling of trust. Well, because so, they got your money for the shiny box. They don't care about your information. No, I'm hoping. That's what I'm hoping for. So I think that I will probably end up streaming my um, pictures onto iCloud because I take so many bloody pictures. But again, but they, see, the thing is, like, with or if, something that happens and I lose my photos because they're on the cloud and then they. I, you know, don't back up exceptionally well. Well, here's uh, the thing. Correct me if I'm wrong, Seth. It's not like a Facebook or a Google service where you they want you to store. They want to become the repository of record. iCloud only keeps 30 days or 1,000 photos, the latest, and then gets rid of the older ones. They expect you to keep the copy on your desktop that's connected to iCloud. Right. They're kind of positioning it as more of a conduit and less as a storage area. They, w they will sell you storage, but the way that stuff like PhotoStream works is that it's really... a, a it's just like a like a crossing guard for all your stuff. So the way you they expect you to do it is that you would take a picture on your iPhone, it gets zapped to your iPad, and the next time you're at your Mac, you open up iPhoto and it gets kind of sucked into your library there and then you can organize it. And then you have a copy there. And so you can browse back in your stream and it's cool because you know I've restored my phone a couple times and then you just kind of flip photo stream back on and your stuff is still there. And I've deleted stuff out of my iPhoto library and then been like, oh man, you know what? I need that. And I just go to photo stream and pull it back out. Granted, that's not forever. That's just, you know, recent, but that's, they're not, they're not positioning it as storage and not positioning it as the canonical place where like, the data lives it's like dropbox right? now seth when i rest and i restore my iphone a lot probably like you because i do a bunch of different stuff with it it is so easy now icloud yeah, is it, just it's I, I i i hit a button on the phone i all my stuff is back i did it at the apple store they swapped out my phone at the counter i just hit icloud and on the wi-fi at the apple store within a couple of minutes it was basically the same iphone and i walked out it it's really good. Like I've done probably at least three, probably four iCloud restores um, since I had the 4S, and it is inside of a half an hour. Your phone is exactly the way it was. Like not not a bit out of place, and it's making and it really hard for me to want to do like a clean restore and start over because it is so good. Oh, putting betas on over iTunes now. I'm like I have to plug into iTunes. Really, Apple. <laughs> Um, and does it remember everything like stuff from your notepad and stuff that's uh, almost everything? Yeah. Almost what does not you it, have to it, it downloads apps and music separately. So it does a complete restore, but then it will download start downloading the apps and then restore the data to the app. So it's just it, I believe there is everything there. It's just a little awkward. You can go and turn individual things off if you want. Yeah. Um, for example, I turn off camera roll backup because I'm already doing photo stream and camera roll just eats up your space quickly. That's what mm -hmm. I do too. Yep. I'm going to move along just because uh, we have a ton of stuff to go through. Um, Chris Umiastowski, our wonderful, wonderful co-host of Stock Talk, is doing a weekly column now on iMore.com. He's already put up one on the education event. And yesterday, he put up one on Apple's monster Q1 uh, beating Wall Street 
um, estimates. By the way, the analysts were so well off, so far off, they're either manipulating or should be fired. Just FYI, Wall Street. Uh, but his takeaway was Apple is firing on all cylinders and still looks like it has plenty of room for growth. So make sure you check that out. And here's my thoughts, Georgia. You asked me earlier uh, my thoughts on you know the competition. And I said that market share was 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 a bunch of bull uh, when Google was beating Apple. And now that Apple is fractionally ahead of Google, I still think it's a bunch of bull. Um, it doesn't matter to me at the end of the day, like me, the consumer, not me, the journalist, me, the consumer, who's selling more stuff. I care about who's making the best phones, the best software, and giving me the best service. And the example I gave um, is that I walked into the Apple store after New Year's and my phone screen has been damaged. I don't know how, but the screen was like sandpaper. And I walked in there expecting to pay $200 for a replacement phone because it's easier for them to replace the phone than to replace the screen. They replaced it, gave me a stern talking to about taking better care of my products. And I said, well, when do I pay you? They're like, no, 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 we're covering it. Just be be better, be more careful with your with your phone. I walked out with a new phone. Apple just did an education event. They're, they made gave away a free textbook authoring tool to everybody. Uh, this week, every week, I download a couple applications whose user interface and user experience are so delightful, I fall in love with using my iPhone and iPad again. That's the stuff that matters to me. The numbers aren't relevant to me as a consumer. It's what they is. I don't think that we should care how well they're doing. I think they should care how well we're liking them. They should be fighting fiercely to delight us. The only metric that counts to me is how good a job they're doing in making me a happy customer. I agree. I think that the fact that I... Uh, that I trust Apple more than I would trust another company that they're going to put out something that works. Um, it was the one thing that I pointed about. I was, um, I forget what I was using on Microsoft, but anyways, I was using something and I was so upset that it didn't just work. We're off the air. <laughs> yeah. I never say that because I restarted almost immediately. Oh, do you? Yeah. And now I have to go edit this out. See, see all the problems you're causing. Okay, well, you know, there we go. You see, if you only worked as well as Apple, if we were, if, <sighs> if our, our internet connection was just as reliable as Apple was, we wouldn't be happy. But I got well. Betty all to put a comment in the chat room, so it was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> he, he already had. It wasn't oh, okay. Supposed to be. Oh, damn. But at least, um, yeah, it's that it happens to work and that I trust that whatever they put out is going to work effortlessly, almost so much so that I believe in it so much so that when something isn't working exactly well, I get exceptionally upset in a, in a greater way. So that's the one thing that I like. Plus, what works with Apple is fun. Using Siri is fun. I get a little kick out of using it, um, getting to do things with it, having it uh, talk to people. It kind of gives me a little bit of a kick. It's because like right after that happened, Seth, I walked into the Rogers store and there was a, like a poor, poor bastard whose Blackberry wasn't working and there's no Blackberry store to go to. And they're like, oh, yeah, well, we'll send it back. It'll take two weeks. We don't have any loaner phones right now. And, and the kid's like, but what am I going to do? And I don't ever want to be in that position. Yeah, well, it just it speaks, again, very strongly to Apple's user centric focus that, you know, the person who's using the device needs to be delighted and and endlessly pleased with it at every point. And I think that the way that they've really handled the retail experience uh, is it exceptional. It's it should be a case study for for marketing classes in colleges because I have never I mean, granted I don't work there, but I've never seen anybody leave an Apple store angry, stomping out, like, I can't believe they did that. Like, yes. I, I'm sure I'm sure it happens. But every time I've been there, everyone is smiling and like everyone is relaxed and pleased and people are helping other people. I've never seen there be a, a, any kind of problem there. So they must be doing something right if people are that pleased with the experience. Well, you just look at the ratio of people that work at the store in comparison to the people come in. The Apple store is filled uh, the store experience is beautiful. They leave a whole bunch of phones that are, and, you know, phones, iPods, Nanos, iPads, you know, MacBooks. They let you use the product for as long as you want. They don't bug you about using it. So you get to enjoy it, get to know it. They teach you how to use it there at the store, and they fix things for you. They You can sell things there. They really have a great user experience in comparison to any other store, and there might be or two disgruntled salespeople that are in the store. Like everything, every experience that they look through, they really try to make it to the user. I agree. All right, I'm going to keep us going. We have tons of stuff to cover.
We um, really do have a lot of stuff to cover. IPhone... We should have two shows for this. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> um, iPhone 5, iPad 3 rumors. The iPad 3 announcement rumored to be coming in a few weeks. That is a rumor from Mac <gasps> Takara, so and that's not what we've heard. We've heard that the iPad 3 is on schedule for March. Um, I'm guessing that means probably an early to mid-March uh, announcement and then a mid to late March launch, but we're not going to get it any sooner. Uh, I and- really doubt that we're going to get it sooner than that. I would love it. I'm not saying that I wouldn't want it. Seth, would you actually get the iPad 3? Are you planning to get the iPad 3 for yourself since you oh, don't yeah. have the iPad 2? Yep. I, that's okay. that's what I've been waiting for, basically. I you know I had the first gen one. I skipped the second gen, but I am raring to go for this one. Okay, because have... if you don't get it, I'm I'm gonna you know rip into you. I'm just saying. Yeah, half the reason I'm getting it is so that you can't tease me. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> the Retina screen seems to be confirmed. We're hearing that that is you know that is good to go. The yield rates and the pricing is in place, so Apple can do that. Uh, we still have not been able to confirm LTE. Uh, some people are talking like, like Apple might put LTE because the Qualcomm chipsets are ready. But LTE, I mean, it's not in a lot of markets yet. It's it's Verizon's got a good rollout. AT and T is starting. Sprint is nowhere to be seen. Rogers and Bell in Canada are kind of doing it in a few big cities, uh, in a couple countries in Europe. But it's not a worldwide technology yet. So I can see Apple saving a few bucks in batteries by by not going LTE yet. Um, Are they going to keep, Renee, do you think they're going to keep the iPad 1 and make it, you know, much cheaper? Or do you think they're going to slowly... The iPad 2? Sorry, no, the first iPad. Well, the first iPad's gone already. That one's not, that one's, they, they can't, they have to ramp that back up for production. But they could keep the iPad 2 around, drop the price the way they do with um, the previous generation iPhones. Like the iPhone 4 is now at 100 bucks, uh, And maybe they could drop it. But the only difference with the iPad is that it's not subsidized. The carriers pay a lot of money to subsidize the prices of the iPhones. They're really much more expensive. And no one does that for the iPad. So if Apple is willing to take a cut in margins, they could lower the price. But Apple is not a company that typically... I know Leanna really thinks they're going to they're gonna give away or sell at cost an educational iPad. And I know uh, Chris in Stock Talk said that they might do that. But Apple is not a razor blades company. They're a razors company. They sell devices that make profit. They run everything else barely above loss so that people buy more hardware. And I think that they, they might sell it for as cheaply as they can, but I don't think it'll be a deep discount. I would I would yeah. agree with that. Yeah, that's too bad. Well, I, I mean... I understand. I completely understand. It's just... But a $400 iPad 2 is not a bad deal. If, if, if they... I, eight gigabytes would make me nauseous. I mean, I would, I would be not well, happy with eight gigabytes. Those... But. Those textbooks are big files, so yeah. if they do, if they do like a like a low market one, they're gonna have to put enough storage in there for a kid to actually have multiple books on there. So I can't imagine that it's gonna be eight gigs. But I believe Apple does do bulk pricing for education. I mean, they they were offering pallets of iPads if you bought like twenty of them. There was a discount price and it was only available to education. So it's possible they'll do something like you know get a pallet of iPad twos at a reduced price. Yeah, make it up on do- volume. They do. They do discounts for businesses and education if you buy volume. They do that. But I, I, that, that volume price, I mean, that lower price is not going to be available to people who are like, I think I'll just take the iPad too. Thanks. Like when you go to the store, you're going to get, if, if, you know, if our guesses are correct, you're going to get the new iPad. That's what they're going to sell in the store because I don't think they're even going to show the other one because it's going to be confusing to people like, well, which one should I buy? There's one iPhone, there's one iPad. That's what you're going to get. But I think that, if ever they're going to do something like a, a reduced price model, I think, I know you just said the thing about the razor blades, and that's, of course, exactly what I was thinking. But if they want to make a play to get the content out and get more people excited about the platform, I, I think that's what they would do. But it would only be to schools, and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be like a $99 thing. It would be the EMAC st- of iPads. Yeah, they'd still be making a profit. It would just be razor thin at that level. I don't know, Apple, they didn't get to $97 billion by making razor-thin profits, Seth Clifford. No, but they do, you know, they've, the eMac was not an expensive computer. I mean, it was, it was more expensive than PCs at the time, but it was not really that expensive. No. Georgia, you were going to yell at us about something? No, well, just, do you think it's going to look any different? Because we already have manufacturers betting that it's going to look the same, just like the iPhone for us. And so making cases that will fit 
Now, we've had people already gamble on making faces yeah. before they actually found out Oopsies. it hasn't ended up really great for them. So, I don't know. Like, if they keep the iPad 2 around, I guess they can always just market these to people that are buying the iPad 2. But if they actually get rid of the iPad 2, they're making a really huge gamble on a case that might not fit. And they're saying it's a millimeter. Well, first, the thing that made me laugh about this story is that they're calling it an iPad 2S. And I guess it's always possible that Apple will iPod, iPad 2S it, but I don't, I don't think it's likely. I mean, usually the, the 2S is when Apple can't find a, like, sorry, the S is when Apple can't find a marketing angle. Like the 3GS looked just like the 3, so like, like the 3G. So they add an S on the 4 looks just like, but if yeah. you put a retina display on something, that's a marketing commercial right there. You don't have to use the S to kind of, oh, we're sorry. We know it's that different. That's why it's not a whole new model. It's just an S model. Um, you, can, you can proudly say iPad 3, retina display, boom. But this is going to be, it, won't, it wouldn't even fit properly on the iPad because it's going to be slightly thicker. Yeah, a millimeter so, or two. I don't know. This gamble seems like something, I don't know. Seems like they are either are, you know, close in with someone that's actually marketing the um, iPads already. Or I don't know what. They're going to be out a lot of money. It makes me think about this iPhone 5 rumor that came out today um, saying that that Apple was already getting it into production maybe for a summer release, but that there were several different form factors and they didn't really know which was going to be the production model. I think Apple's going to start doing that. We saw that in the firmware. You know, Before, people say, oh, look, we found iPhone 5, 1 in the firmware. They're starting to test a new model. Um, and then Apple's like, okay, well, here's 10, 1, 32, 1. Here's iPad 97, just to start messing that. with people. And they might do that. They might say, all right, you guys want to start making cases? Here's an iPad that's a triangle. Here's an iPhone that's a tetrahedron. Go ahead, spend 10 well, grand making your cases, jerks. I can see how they would want to mess with us blogger people. Um, I don't think that they would want to do that to people that make accessories for Apple on purpose. Well, they bribe, you know, they're trying to bribe Apple manufacturing partners to give them secret information. I definitely see, especially Jobs. I don't know if Tim Cook would do it, but I guess especially Jobs go, F them, send, send them a Kleenex shaped uh, iPad. Right. Tim Cook does not seem to be as spiteful as Steve was and as um, personal, isn't as personal with. No, <laughs> he's quiet and he could be putting out iPads that look like D&D dice for all we know. I would buy one. Just to mess with people. D&D die. Holy hell. Well, you know, so this this rumor was actually interesting. It came out and it said it was it claims to have been from an uh, Foxconn, which is Apple's manufacturing partner, and it said that it had a four plus inch display. It wasn't teardrop shaped. It was symmetrical in thickness. It did not have the iPhone 4S uh, form factor, but it, there were several devices. Um, and immediately the rumor was countered, saying that no, it has not yet gone into production. And it, while it may have a four-inch uh, screen, if Apple can fit into the current size, they're not going to make the actual phone any bigger. And I, I don't see a summer release because nine months. Apple already showed they can keep making money when they put out a new phone every fifteen months, and I think that's dangerous because there'll be a lot of competitive devices. But I, I think nine months is way too little. I, I, the last we heard, they were they were thinking about a fall release again. Well, let's think about this in terms of the software, right? If they're going to put a summer release together, that means we need to start seeing betas of iOS 6 sooner than people probably understand or think. April, right? And yeah, and I don't see that happening at all. I don't I don't see that happening because they've we're we're at 5.0.1 right now, you know, in in wide release on the phone. That's barely scratching the surface. We haven't I, even I, seen 5.1 go public yet. Right. I, I really don't think we're going to see another summer release. I think they, for whatever reason, they landed in the fall, whether it was delays or on purpose or whatever, it doesn't matter. People bought the phone uh, in ridiculous numbers and they probably went, oh, all right, great. I, I think they're not going to artificially accelerate this process knowing that they could take a little more time, they could buy themselves some time and do a much bigger, better release at that point. And in terms of there's going to be a lot of other phones, I don't think they care. I think they've shown with the last release that basically everybody hemmed and hawed and said, oh, it's just like the iPhone 4 and all these other phones came out that have bigger screens and 4G. It, it's, a, it's a non-issue. It's, 55% it's, of people didn't care. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's a different market. Georgia, do you I like the idea that the that. bezel would go away, that it would just be screen? I could do that. I definitely could. 
I don't, don't have need, big beefy hands though, but I, my finger, I never stick my fingers on the edges of my phone ever. Like I don't need to hold my phone and have my fingers all over my phone in order to, to keep hold of it. And the numbers that Apple has just to go to what Seth was commenting on, but the numbers that Apple has, they really don't have to rush. Yeah. If they can wait a little bit longer and make something a little bit better, I can see them doing that because they can. No, I agree. Do you um, stick fingers on the on the front on the front glass of your phone? No, I hold mine on the side. See, John Fingers from Electronista was saying that people need room for that. My hands go on the side, like all good-hearted people. I don't need to go on the front. What do you mean the front? Like wrap your fingers yeah, around? Yeah, like hold it. Like so, there's a there's an edge so you can touch the front without hitting the multi-touch display. And I don't really ever. It's it's such a thin edge anyway, and I have such uncoordinated digits that. I stay Some far away. Some saying that the bezel was needed because that's where people stick their phone and they'd be touching. Yeah, I don't yeah, buy it. That right. is some weird phone holding. I can't get behind that. <laughs> there are a couple other <laughs> interesting things. Um, there was there was talk that Steve Jobs had had a meeting with the Lytro light field camera company. Those are the people that make that long camera box that has a very low aperture and basically captures so much information that you can change the focal point of a picture later on in editing. It's that really cool. really cool. The camera itself looks, you know, take a pic, uh, look at the article. The camera looks sick. Yeah. But it's also four point something inches wide and I don't think Apple's going to make a four point something inch thick iPhone anytime soon. I mean, I'd but love an, an iPhone cube, but I don't think it's going to happen. No, but that the fact that they're at the forefront of photography means that Apple is interested in making something more than even, not as they did with the batteries, bringing the batteries you know, well beyond where people could expect their battery power to be and small. Maybe they're trying to do the same thing with photography. You could tell, eh, Seth, in the last... Um keynote that Schiller and Apple were really into the photography angle. And I think they even said in the Steve Jobs book that photography was one of the things he wanted to revolutionize. Yeah, I I think that as those sensors get better and we start seeing the camera and the phones improving, I think it became more of a focus for them. And I think that's part of delivering that experience because everybody loves taking, well, not everybody, but people love taking pictures. And that's something that they share with other people. That's something that's a very personal activity. That's something that's a social activity. So I think to make the phone as good as it can possibly be, I mean, the camera in the phone, sorry. Um, I think that plays very strongly into into the kind of position that they're taking with delivering these kinds of experiences. And obviously, apps that center around use of the camera are extraordinarily popular. And I think that a lot of people would pick up a phone because the camera was amazing or did something that other phones would not. I think that it would sell a lot more phones. They want to replace their... I mean, the other rumor was that Sony was getting ready a 13 megapixel um, piece of glass that might make its way into the next iPhone. It would allow them to make it even thinner, which Apple you know, really likes. It's a big, beautifully backlit CMOS sensor with HDR video built in. Um that that sounds like a very good short-term goal, but I go back to George's point from a bunch of shows is that Apple is spending a whole bunch of time on the cameras, still nothing but on the what speakers. Is up with those speakers, this and, and the sound control, it it absolutely infuriates me that I'm watching something on YouTube and I can't hear it from my iPad, from my iPhone, and or from my Air. I actually cannot increase the sound anything more. I think that it's wonderful that Apple, you know cares about my ears but i want to be able to have one better sound and two much more volume control please like please i can take care of my own ears it's just you don't have to be daddy to me it's upsetting speaking of which um you know apple does everything apple thinks they know better than us they control the experience and to a large part that helps a big swath of mainstream society the rest are the jailbreakers and they got a giant giant gift last week uh when the it was it was uh, Posix Ninja, I think, who put it out. It was a team of people who did it. But iPhone 4S, iPad 2 is now available for jailbreak via Green Poison Absinthe. You can be the master of your Apple A5 chip-powered device. And there's been an influx of people drinking Absinthe as well. <laughs> is that associated? Do they I get don't a percentage? know. There actually is. It's, there's a resurgence. So I'm like, hmm. 
And they, they shared some numbers, though, and this was actually interesting. Um, they had 491,325 new iPhone 4 devices jailbroken, 308,967 new iPad 2 devices broken, 152,940 previously jailbroken iPad 2s that upgraded from iOS 4, where Georgia, you know, is safely keeping herself, uh, close to a million, 953,000 total um, jailbreaks done with with uh, absinthe already. That is huge. We actually, well, Georgia, you actually ran polls for us, and our numbers back when Chris did the roundup were forty three percent of our forty forty percent of our readers already jailbroke the iPad two, thirty three percent had already jailbroken the four S, and a bunch of them were just waiting for bug fixes to to do it themselves. And if you're worried or scared to do it, take a look at our how to, because, um, you know, if, I, if Ali can help me jailbreak live on the show, she can help you jailbreak on her how to videos. She does a great job with them. So it's everything that you need to know, all of your fears taken care of. And she did a great job. She did uh, how to jailbreak from basically just covered everything and she's she's doing a ton of stuff in the forums too if you need help with windows with mac with iphone 4s with ipad 2 uh just go to forums.imore.com head over to the jailbreak section and she and her army of jailbreakers will help you out and she also went through uh troubleshooting issues common to jailbreak which is wonderful so um little different issues that you might have um Floating icons, white icons, uh, things that are crashing, what you could happen to do if those are problems that you're having with your jailbreak. And there's always, I mean, uh, jailbreak is a, is a bleeding edge technology. There's always going to be issues. It's not like they get, you know, a public beta cycle, thousands of testers. Um, yeah, it, it's always, always they're trying to stay one step ahead of Apple. So it's, if, by all means, um, take advantage of those. And the other thing that's interesting, Georgia, is that the, I don't know if you remember, but two years ago, the Library of Congress gave an exception to jailbreaking in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Before that, it was kind of nebulous whether jailbreaking was illegal or whether you could get sued for breaking the cryptographic um, copy, sorry, the um, encryption to jailbreak your device. And they gave, um, basically, they didn't, they didn't say it was legal, but they gave it an exemption. And that is up now. The jailbreak exemption will be up this year. And the Electronic Freedom Foundation would like your help to not only have it uh, renewed, but have it extended to all smartphones, all tablets, and video game consoles, too, so that Sony can stop sh- uh, suing Geohot and forcing him to leave Facebook and, and such. And it's important whether or not which way, you know, you kind of fall on the jailbreaking, you know, it depends on do you believe, you know, what do you own and what do you have access to and what can you change? So it's kind of an important thing about your rights with your technology and what you buy, what you have. And I see some questions in the forum, like if you, sorry, in the chat room, like if you jailbreak, will you lose your unlock? Some people ask, would they lose App Store access? Uh, just go to the forum, forum.imore.com. Um, all those questions are are answered there. You don't lose anything. You just gain the right. You basically jailbreak means you break the root jail of the phone, and it lets you run unsigned applications, utilities, and otherwise hack the firmware. You don't lose anything. You just you maybe maybe depending on what you do, you'll lose a little bit of stability or battery life if you're running a ton of stuff, but you gain a lot too. Yeah. Which brings on. us to Georgia. Um, you are going to try and go as long as you can without jailbreaking, correct? Uh, yes. And yes. how's it going so far? So far, uh, do I miss it? Yes. What I do you do miss? miss Specifics. Aspects on my phone. I miss the fact of uh, getting the manner in which I I don't I don't mind the the um, the lock screen as much. Uh, it's okay. I don't like the fact that I have to you know close things in order for my text. I don't like the fact that I cannot actually click on a. Uh, a uh, note when it comes up and actually open up the application right from there and not have Yeah, it. in iOS 5, you actually have to go into the app. You don't get a quick preview of any of the messages. Right. Um, I don't like the ability to customize. So, um, you know, certain things that I don't happen to like, like I have to actually uh, unlock my phone in order to turn off alarms or other things like that. I kind of miss it. Plus, the one main thing that I like about the jailbreak is that if I do want to do something, I can. So if there's something that bothers me about the phone, I can choose to say, oh, you know what? I'm going to choose it. I see something that's a really nice You theme. like the freedom. I like the choice to be able to use it if I so wish right away. 
Seth and I had very similar things that we missed from jailbreak, I believe, Seth. Yeah, our our use cases are pretty much aligned. And I, as much as I want to jailbreak, I just haven't yet because I'm like, you know what? Uh, if I if I really find myself with some time, I, I might feel like tinkering. But quite honestly, I've been on iOS 5 since the betas last summer. And I've gotten used to the new flows. And it does 97% of what I wanted to do at this point. Like we we miss some stuff. Like we can't. There's a lot of really cool um, Siri hacks. A lot of really cool notification hacks. Putting SB settings and notifications. Uh, yeah. Byte SMS to do in-app responses. Uh, Being able to put folders and folders and folders. Happening. Nobody yeah. does that. Nobody likes that except you. <laughs> me? You're kidding me? Really? Yeah. No we didn't want to tell you. We were. We didn't, <laughs> didn't want to break your heart. I love having like six or seven things on my dock too. No but, one else does that either. I mean, Georgia and I me. have free tethering, but in some places, people like the tethering apps, or they like the three G enabler app, so that you can do FaceTime and other things over three G. I mean, there are there are definitely use cases. It just comes down to, like Seth said, are those important enough for you that you'll spend the time and effort to jailbreak? And yeah, and that that may change. Like in a month or two, if I decide, wow, I really need to do X, and there's a great jailbreak app that does that, I very well may do it. But for now, my needs are mostly served, and I'm just too busy to be fiddling. Right. Too busy to right. be fiddling. Yes, the polished screen is really nice too. Great too. episode title. Just saying. Um, so, <laughs> yours. Obama was was having a dinner and asked Steve Jobs if he was going to start manufacturing uh, Apple products again in the U.S. as they at one time were, and Steve Jobs pretty curtly said, politely but curtly said, uh, the jobs are not coming back to the yep. U.S. Um, First off, we did have a discussion before about the cost that it would be. And um, I don't know if other people have been watching the podcast, but... Of course 20, they have been. Of course. Really about, you know, two different articles said between 20 and 30% I more. said an iPad would cost $5,000 if they made it in the U.S. Yes. And it came out to an iPad would probably cost about $800. Yeah, I still challenge their math. I think they have no idea the kind of incremental and, and auxiliary costs that, that you North American manufacturing costs. You also said like $500 for like an, a U.S. made uh, microwave. No, $5,000 for a U.S. made microwave. Yeah, it was. it's like 150 bucks. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to check and see if that's actually made in the U.S. and not just like designed in California or something. California is the U.S. Uh, no, I know. Oh, you mean only designed? Yeah. No, no, fully made in the U.S. We did this in Tijuana, USA. It's, you know, right off the truck. I'm going to double check those stats. But yeah, no, but I mean, so what was the reason then? Why, if it wasn't the cost of manufacturing, what was it? Well, unfortunately, uh, Chinese manufacturers are so much more flexible than U.S. ones because we have so many limits on time when workers will do it. And you had a wonderful story, Renee, of... Um, when uh, when Steve needed to have the iPads made really, really quickly. Can oh, here. So, yeah. So this is funny. Really it wasn't my story. I cribbed this entirely from the New York Times. I'm good at cribbing. Uh, they had the story about Steve Jobs having the original iPhone in his pocket. And the original iPhone had a plastic screen when it was still in prototype stage. And his keys were scratching it. And this incensed Steve. So he basically went to the iPad, the iPhone manufacturing team. And he said, you have a couple weeks to put a glass screen on this. Uh, sort of like Prince asking for a camel in the middle of the night in Minnesota. I mean, he doesn't. He just wants you to do your job. He doesn't care how realistic it is. And so uh, someone got on a plane. They went to China. Because workers in China live in dormitories on the factory grounds, the foreman got 8,000 people out of bed, had them work 12-hour shifts, and within 96 hours, they had 10,000 glass screened um, iPhones made. This would never happen in America. Who are you waking up? Who, 12 hours? I got to 12 hours right here. I'm going back to this. I'm not living in your dormitory. I got an apartment in the borough. I mean, it, that's why I say it will cost $5,000 because that American guy is not living in a dormitory getting woken up in the middle of the night to walk a 12, to work a 12-hour shift. But China, they they have a different perception of how workers you know, are going to work. And bless them, they did it in 96 hours. Seth is shaking his head. He didn't, he didn't like my Kentucky accent. Oh, was that Kentucky? No, I have no, that I have no idea which states are where. <laughs> yeah. But you, you can't pull... I mean, that, there's no way that would happen in America. No, certainly not. You try getting local 472 out of bed at 12 in the morning to work a 12-hour shift. You'll wind up a speed bump. 
But the people at Foxconn are so upset that they're, you know, threatening mass suicides if people don't change their working conditions. Is well, it worth the trade off? No, so I mean, but that, that, that's, I guess, uh, that's, that's a very valid issue. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's entirely different. I mean, in North America, and I don't want to get too far into this because we're going to, we're going to run late, but industrial revolution times, there were horrible working conditions. We used to have child labor. The reason we have all these laws is because at a certain point in time, our society decided that certain things were not worth the cost on the society for those things. And we established laws and unionized and, you know, regardless of which way you think the pendulum has now swung, um, we have got more worker protections and it's just a different society. And China's going sort of going through that process now. There was an interesting story about how India was developing a middle class and because they were becoming more demanding, companies were now re-outsourcing to Sri Lanka, which didn't protect workers as much as even India did. So um, it's sort of like the, 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 the society does not have the same sort of priorities at the same time every place. Okay. And there you go. And big companies take advantage of the places where they can get done what they want to get done. Yeah, that's the icky part about it, really. Yeah. Five thousand dollar iPads. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be five thousand. It'd be like eight hundred and fifty dollars for an iPad. We can afford that. They're okay. luxury items in the first place. I don't. I don't think you can get local forty seven to live in a dormitory outside your factory and wake up you at don't midnight. Have to. You don't have to. So what if Steve wants a glass iPad? Are you can just tell him no. No. He's there... gonna have to wait a few days. Ah, it's see? okay. So the, uh, this this is going to make George's blood boil. I, said, I, I want to see you're angry before the end of the show. O2 oh. accidentally made it so that any website you went to on your iPhone uh, had access to your telephone number. It was oh, an God, accident. Suck- it's okay. I put your telephone number on my iPad, so. Oh, Sorry. bollocks. That was for Ashley. Bollocks. Um, yeah. I, is this a big oops, Seth? I mean, they say they fixed it now, but what kind of coding error do you make where it actually sends the phone number as part of the URL string? Yeah. Um, I don't know, because that seems just like the dumbest mistake I've ever heard. Like, why Why would that Why would that even need to be a part of the code in the first place? Like, that's never been an issue anywhere else with any other phone before. Why... Why was that necessary? I, I couldn't even begin to offer you an answer. It's, yeah. Uh, anyway, apparently they fixed it. I don't know. It makes me, it may, uh, I, I don't even know what an explanation for this is. How, how does that happen? How does it happen? How do they even have it in the first, like, I don't understand. What is the, what is the official like, Google they, code for adding they, phone numbers? Right. Like, it almost makes me think it was done intentionally and they were hoping they wouldn't get or, found uh, out. Exactly out your information and by mistake they sent it all out i don't know or if they were just selling that data to advertisers or or whatever you know like it just it doesn't sound like an accidental thing it sounds like something somebody did and said yeah that's a great idea and the business was like yeah all right sure if you think we can get away with it that's how it sounds i don't know have you seen all the stuff google's getting away with i mean they're selling discount medication they're giving away your private event new privacy we could do that too well, the UK, the UK right now is taking a look into um, the selling and using of people's information and that you have to opt in. Yeah. And if you don't, and you have to disclose what you're selling to who and what you're actually sniffing for. And if you don't, and if we ask you to delete it, you have to delete it and delete it forever and delete it from your servers, not just from the public knowledge of that. That passes awesome i hope there's like a sopa level backlash see people got all excited about sopa um but like there's there's worse stuff out there there's acta and even beyond that all this privacy stuff all the stuff that georgia said facebook was doing the stuff that google's been caught doing recently i mean don't be evil they were like smiling and making you turn around and bend over at the same time and that's just as, i think there'll be a privacy backlash and that we really need some some control taken back as, as buffy would say they've become the big bad yes scratch their surface and what do you find more surface all our information. Yeah. Uh, Seth, anything else you want to rant about? Oh, dude, don't get me started. I'm good for now. All right. Georgia, anything you want to take issue with? No. No, I'm hungry. Uh, you're always <laughs> hungry after the podcast now. Are you out slaying vampires beforehand? You know, I, I'm so anemic. The vampires would die if they ate <laughs> me. That's all I have to say. Uh, all right. So I am just going to thank... Uh, let's see. Who am I going to start with? I'm going to thank Seth Clifford for joining us. Thanks, Seth. Oh, thank you, sir. Where can we find out more about you? 
You can find me on Twitter at Seth Clifford. You can find me on the I More shows and on Iterate with Renee and Mark Edwards of Django. And if you'd like to see some of the work we do, apps and sites that we build, please visit our website, nfidm.com. We are Nickelfish. And Georgia, where can we find out more about you? You can find me on Twitter at Georgia T-I-P-P. And you can also find me on the website, www.imore.com. Dot com. Nice. And you can find me at Renee Ritchie. You can find me at imore.com. And you can find me at mobilenations.com. And if you are at Macworld, if you're a developer, an accessory maker, or just a fan of the site and want to say hello, please do come up, you know, introduce yourself, say hi to Leanna and I. We would love to meet you. Um, you can reach all of us on Twitter at iMore. You can email us at podcast at iMore.com, or you can leave a comment on the site when the show goes live. We are here every Wednesday night, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, 2 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. And our companion show, Georgia, the brand new Apps and Accessories Live, is when again? It is every Sunday night, 9 p.m. Eastern. Same bat time. That channel. For all of our podcasts, audio and video, and video alike, including iPhone and iPad Live, Apps and Accessories Live, Zen and Tech, Super Functional, Iterate, Girls Gone Gadgets, and more, head on over to mobilenations.com slash shows. And if you haven't already, please go to iTunes. Please subscribe to the shows. Please leave a rating. It encourages iTunes to feature us. It means we get more great listeners and viewers like you, and uh, we love that. I want to thank the I'm More Accessory Store for sponsoring this show. And I want to thank everyone who showed up for the live chat. Um, you guys just rock. From Christy Lynn to Brad Morris to Frey Dog to Jonine Woods to Jessica Ramos, Ed Holm, uh, Petaf. Uh, all of you people, you were just Michael. fantastic. Yeah, Michael. I'm missing you, Sock. Where are you, Sock? Oh, you Jay Davey, probably in Vegas. Jay. Anyways, guys, have a wonderful evening. Uh, we love you very much. And we will see you live from Macworld soon. See you guys. Bye.